Welcome to the 18th session of Within the Shadow of the Galilean, Countdown to the Cross. During this session, we will look at the Passover story as we find it in Mark 14, up through Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. The story starts two days before Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and the scribes are looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him, but not during the festival, they say, because there might be a riot. While Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with alabaster to anoint Jesus with nard, and she broke it open and poured the ointment over his head, which began an angry argument. Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii say some of the disciples. But Jesus says, let her alone. Why would you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. So she did what she could, and she anointed Jesus' body. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, whenever the good news is proclaimed around the world, she will be remembered. After this, Judas went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. And they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So Judas began to look for ways to betray Jesus. It was now the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. And Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? We will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparation for us. For the disciples set out and went into the city and found the man with the jar of water and prepared for the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now the disciples became distressed, and one after another asked Jesus, Surely not me. And Jesus said to them, it is the one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written for him. But woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better that that person never be born.
while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after he blessed it, Jesus broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. And Jesus said to them, This is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for, for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new, in the kingdom of God. When they finished singing, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to Jesus, Even though all become deserters, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will never deny you. And all of them, said the same thing. They went out to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here for a while and pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And Jesus said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, Jesus threw himself to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. Jesus said, God, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And Jesus came and found Peter and James and John sleeping and he said to Peter Simon are you asleep could you not keep awake for an hour keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial the spirit is indeed willing but the flesh is weak and again Jesus went away and prayed saying the same words and once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say. Jesus came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest enough? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's get going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While they were still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them this sign. 
One I will kiss is the man you want. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they all laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I am a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted Jesus and fled. I hope this telling of the Passover story has captured the drama that's present there. The conspiracy to commit murder, the kingly anointing of Jesus, an opportunity to find a way to betray the king, the, the Passover meal in the midst of the search to commit murder, treachery at the meal, the making of a new covenant at the Passover meal, uh, the promise that there will be denial, the grief of knowing the hour has come, a kiss of betrayal, uh, resistance to arrest, then eventually desertion and the capture of the king. Let's turn now to the structure of the passion story and see if we can find places that are highlighted to help us understand it better. The story begins with a conspiracy, a kingly anointing, and a betrayal. Those three go together in a simple sandwich format two pieces of bread with the meat in the middle. And it's the same with the rest of Mark 14. There is the preparation for the Passover. There's treachery at the meal. There's a making of a new covenant. There is a promise of betrayal. And then there is the grief and capture. Once again, making a sandwich of a couple pieces of bread, uh, some lettuce in between, and then the meat of the Lord's Supper at the middle. So it seems from this quick look of the structure of the first part of the Passover story, the kingly anointing and the Passover meal, and particularly the covenant at the Passover meal, the new covenant, stand at the center of the story so far. We are going to now turn to looking at the Lord's Supper, the new Passover meal, the new covenant. The first thing we need to remember when we look at Jesus' last meal with his disciples is Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that it happened on the first day of unleavened bread. It's the day before Passover begins, but at the same time, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all present the meal as a Passover meal. Now, the Passover meal that's celebrated today really developed after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 of the common era. And so Passover 
as we celebrate today is different than the Passover that Jesus celebrated before the temple was destroyed. But there are some common elements that are very important in celebrating Passover that have always been done whenever the Passover has been celebrated. And it's been celebrated for thousands of years. In Passover meals, there's always the breaking of unleavened bread. And even in Deuteronomy, they talk about the bread that's broken at the Passover meal being the bread of affliction as they remember their slavery in Egypt and as the bread of freedom, as a reminder of their freedom as they're coming out of Egypt. And they have always had four cups of wine that are celebrated, or, or they drink during the Passover meal. That's based on a passage from Exodus in chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being a slave to them. I will deliver you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So Passover is the celebration of the Exodus, the beginning of the Exodus, which celebrates the freedom from slavery. But then they travel to Sinai, and it is at Mount Sinai that the Israelites make covenant with God. The idea of the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup during Passover have powerful symbolic significance for those who participate. And so with that, let's begin looking at first how Mark tells us about what happens at the meal. Then we'll look at what Matthew tells us what happens at the meal. Then we'll look at what Luke tells us about what happens at the meal. And significantly and importantly, we need to also look at what Paul tells us about what happens at the meal. So as we look at the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of Mark, we notice that while they're eating, Jesus takes a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body, the bread of affliction and freedom embodied in Jesus. And then he takes a cup, and he blesses it, and he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When the Gospel of Matthew gets to the Lord's Supper, he follows Mark pretty much. Um, we have the assumption in Mark that Jesus gives the cup to the disciples. In Matthew, that's just made clear. And then Matthew adds also that the cup is all about the forgiveness of sins. Um, Matthew always changes the kingdom of God to the kingdom of heaven or my father's heaven. So that's, that's pretty much the same. Matthew seems to follow and just add a little bit 
to John's, or excuse me, to Mark's Lord's Supper. When we get to the Gospel of Luke, once again, Luke follows the structure, but adds uh, for the bread, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when he gets to the end, it's not just a covenant. It is a new covenant. We need to include Paul's instructions on the Lord's Prayer to a small community in Corinth because it is the earliest that we have. And Paul's instructions is that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, once again, he took a loaf, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, the bread of affliction and freedom, and said, this is my body, that is for you, and just like Luke, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, again like Luke, of a new covenant. And then, once again, he says, do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So what's our takeaway here? It seems all for remembering of the Lord's Supper. For the bread, it is all about the affliction and the freedom that is embodied in Jesus. But each one then looks at the cup from a different perspective, or at least there is a tradition behind Mark and Matthew, and there is a different tradition behind Luke and Paul. You can find the different tradition in the last words that Jesus says in Mark and Matthew. Um, Jesus is looking ahead that I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you or just new in the kingdom. It's forward focused, which gives us a hint for Matthew and Mark of which cup Jesus may have shared, or at least in their tradition, which cup of the Passover meal, the Seder, they are emphasizing. It's different for Luke and Paul. For Mark and Matthew, it may be that they are envisioning Jesus taking the fourth cup, which is known as the cup of Elijah, that comes from the phrase, I will take you. In the Jewish tradition, there is a sense that Elijah was taken into heaven and may one day return. So in the Seder meal, in the Passover meal, there was a fourth cup of wine that was never drank. If in Matthew and Mark's story, Jesus takes the fourth cup, the traditional saying is, according to ancient Jewish tradition, the prophet Elijah did not die. He simply ascended to heaven in a fiery chariot and vanished. The belief grew that someday Elijah would return to earth. And as a forerunner of the Messiah, he would prepare the way for a great age of peace. At least that's how it's read in one of the Seder liturgies today. It's a powerful symbolism. This cup that had never had anyone drank for it from it in thousand years. Jesus takes this cup, the Elijah cup and says, this is my blood of the new covenant, and drinks it. A powerful symbolism looking forward in Mark and Matthew. This communion liturgy, so to speak, could have developed very early on 
within the discipleship communities. Matter of fact, within a year or two after Jesus' death, with that community in Jerusalem that may have been looking forward to the return of Jesus as Jews were looking forward to the return of Elisha. The closing words in the Lord's Supper or, or the liturgy that we find with Paul and in Luke, the purpose seems significantly different than we find it in Matthew and Luke. The whole purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember, is to remember and do this in remembrance of Jesus. And, and so for Paul, who is the earliest copy we have of the Lord's Supper, the intent is to look back at the redeeming power in Christ's death and resurrection. And so for Paul, Paul is probably envisioning Jesus taking the third cup, the cup that symbolizes God's redemption, and then saying, this is my blood poured out for you in a new covenant. So for Paul and then for Luke, who then probably stands within that Paul tradition, the intent of communion, the Lord's Supper, is to look back at the redeeming power of Jesus' death and resurrection. And then for, for Luke, the redeeming power of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. So shortly after Jesus' death, two things happen. One is that they participate in a communal meal, not just a little piece of bread and a dipping in a cup, but a full supper that is an ongoing affirmation of their commitment to a covenant with Jesus, Jesus' mission, and the community. And that grows out of the second significant thing that happens that we will not talk about, but it is baptism. Baptism is a commitment to be a trusting and loyal member of the Christ communities in which this Lord's meal, this communion happens. What does seem to go back to Jesus? is that sense of open communing around meals. Jesus welcomes everyone who wants to eat with him to sit down and eat with him. Tax collectors, sinners, the wealthy, the poor, the hungry, uh, multiplying the food, giving people the food they need for their daily bread. It seems that central ministry of Jesus carries over into this new sense of communing and Lord's Supper after his death.